Give a big hand to uh, Frederick. Hi. Uh, my plan was to speak in English if nobody objects forcefully. Uh, I think it's actually better for YouTube and everybody. My name is Fredrik Rutz, um, and I want to talk today about digital transform learning in a hurry experience from a pandemic. I also want in this talk, I have a second part, which is shorter, uh, where I will make some statements to start a discussion about what e-learning and edtech is from also your point of view to, in a way, uh, <coughs> construct this group and what it should be about. I have ideas about it, but I still want to hear what you think and what you want to know about EdTech and e-learning and who you want to have here as a speaker in the future. This was, yes. If you have any questions during this talk, just raise your hand and we'll take them as we go. So welcome. And this picture I think is nice because in a way, this is where I think we should go, empty classrooms, at least for everything we're teaching that is in a classroom. We teach a lot of stuff that needs something else than a classroom, for instance, patients or maybe a bridge or I don't know what. But we teach a lot of things that where we sit in the classroom and in my view, it's not really necessary to have this classroom anymore or all these houses. I'm going to soften this statement up a bit, a bit later, but <coughs> This is, this is old. We need a new now. Very shortly about me, I'm a, a computer system scientist from the beginning, and then I um, started uh, um, studying user experience. And in the last 10 years or so, I've been more and more interested in learning and e-learning, basically. I started a, uh, tried to start a company back in 2011, which I called then World Academy. It didn't, that name didn't stick, it was the project name, where I wanted to educate the whole world for free while the teachers got paid. Basically, what I wanted to do in that startup company was to take a lot of courses that existed, PhD students, teachers at universities that had a lot of courses, and put them on a website, and then try to um, make it available to everybody because I think learning, should be, learning and knowledge should be available to everybody. Uh, I've started a couple of companies, a uh, usability consultancy company, and uh, I've been, been part of a couple of other companies. So that's me. I have also have two poodles, as you can see down in the corner. If you have any questions at all after this talk, please email me at that email address, frederick at roots.se. This, I think this is kind of uh, ironic. I just handed out a note here in the physical space because we're doing e-learning, so you, we need pieces of paper too to actually do this. There are two links on this note. The first is amenti.com, which is where you can go in with this code, 31350406, and just not jot down what you think e-learning is about what the most important topics about e-learning are. During this talk, please, when you find that I'm getting too boring and you, can, you need to do something else. The other part is a Google Doc. And it's one Google Doc for everybody. I put the slides in from, from this uh, presentation, and then you can take notes in this Google Doc. All of you, if you want to. Afterwards, if you think that you want this document with the notes, so we get everybody's notes, not just your old, own notes, but everybody's, I'll email it to you, if, you may, if, if there's anything of interest in the document. So, questions so far? Not really. I was a teacher at Malmö University. <coughs> I've been there for two and a half years. And then suddenly a pandemic hit due to COVID. We had the normal, we were in the houses, we were in the classrooms, uh, we had a lot of teaching, the, the usual stuff that you do in a, in a university, 
at a theoretical, mostly theoretical education in media technology. Um, I was just about to have a seminar series of four seminars with about 80 students. And the previous year in that seminar, I had taken the students, they were going to learn how to do marketing research. So I'd taken them to the Malmö Central Station and they, were, they had um, done an observation for about 30 minutes, each student at the center station, and also handed out a questionnaire to somebody. Would actually, they had a questionnaire that they asked people on in the central station. And the research question they were going to ask, the market research question is, what can you do if you have an hour in, the center, in, Mar in Malmö Central Station, but you don't want to spend any money? You come in with the train, and you're just going to stay there for an hour, an hour and a half. What can you do in, at Malmö Central Station? And how can you enhance Malmö Central Station so that you can actually spend about 60 to 90 minutes there without spending money? So this is what, what they were going to do. Uh, about a week before that, the feeling got kind of queasy. It's like, okay, I'm going to send uh, four times 20 students to Malmö Central Station. A lot of people, we have a pandemic on that is on the rise. Is it really good to put the students in this situation? And then they have to stand right in front of a strange person or a person they don't know and ask a questionnaire. I didn't feel good about it. So I rethought this whole uh, setup uh, and made it digital, basically. The first change was that the interviews, instead of observation, they, they, I, I had them do interviews instead. And these interviews were done, they could do it either through Zoom or through telephone, or if they wished, they could actually talk to somebody physically. But that was up to them. I didn't force them to. Uh, and since it's not much use to talk about the Malmö Central Station when you're not at Malmö Central Station, they instead talked about social media, since they all studied media technology. They knew a lot about, they know a lot about social media. Um, and this they had to do before the seminar. They put all their findings from these interviews, short interviews, 15 minutes tops, into a communal do Google document. So we had one transcription of, of everything. The other uh, thing I did was that they had to ask also people, four people they didn't know, in the Google Docs questionnaire uh, at a distance, but this was about Malmö Central Station, what you can do at Malmö Central Station. Because I didn't have time to actually change all these things uh, in, the, in the short amount of time I had before the seminar started. Uh, and then we had Zoom and data sense making and trying to and discussing this over Zoom, which worked quite well. Because we had the I, Zoom, you know, I guess, you can share the screen, you can uh, talk to each other, you can raise your hand and, and all this stuff. So that worked quite well. Um, the students, they responded brilliantly. They just switched gears. Hello. And, and did what I asked them to without any preparation or any, any time to actually switch gears. The next time this um, course was given, I changed the questionnaire so they would actually talk about social media in the questionnaire too, which was more in line with the new questioning. But the important part is, is what wasn't actually the research question. The important part was trying these methods and, and understanding how it works to be in a situation where you do an interview or where you do actually ask somebody a questionnaire. Uh, so that's what I wanted to, to make them understand. Um, what I did right in that short period of time was good communication. I talked to the students. I, uh, we, we used a uh, learning management system where I could push out information and it was clear enough for them to understand it. And if it wasn't clear, they could ask. They sent me an email and I clarified the, the method they were going to use. Um, <clears throat> so good communi communication helps in these matters. The other thing I think I did right was not actually changing the first um, questionnaire so that it was still about Malmö Central. The data they collected wasn't very good, but we still could have a discussion about 
what data is, how you, how you interpret the data, what you do with it, and where you can go with it. So basically, what, what I, uh, what I want to say with this is, in the rapid trans trans transformation, always focus on what's needed. Don't try to change everything at once. OK, so this was March 2020, and also some point afterwards. I'm going to get to Zoom in a minute. But I've had 200 students who have never met in real life, which is extremely interesting, to get, as a teacher, you need to have a personal, co personal connection to the students, I believe it, anyway, to actually make them want to listen to you and make them uh, basically do what you say, trust you, so that they think that what you're talking about actually makes sense and is worthwhile listening to. This has worked, I think, reasonably well, both in large groups, lectures, seminars, but uh, I've also had uh, a lot of uh, bachelor students, uh, so it was one-on-one -on -one meetings, and it still works through Zoom, through the digital means that we have. Another course I've been involved in, in is digital marketing, and this spring, and these students, uh, the, the course is given the first year of the, the, uh, the, the program, and these students have never met each other. Maybe they have now, like in the last few weeks, but when this course was given, when they started, and until this course was given in the spring, the digital marketing course, they never met each other. Or I, when I say they, I mean most of them. Some lived in Malmö, so they probably met. But most of the students have never met each other. They, even, they didn't even move to Malmö. They stayed put where they lived before they were accepted to this program. Even so, they created videos together at a distance. I know one for a fact that one group never met for anything each student recorded their part of a video, it was a marketing video, uh, recorded their part of the video, and then they talked to each other and somebody cut it and, and edited it so it became one film for this course. I think this is pretty amazing that it works uh, with people who have never met. And I think that one reason it worked is structure and communication and also from the parts of the, the teachers, patience, but also from the students towards each other. That we need a lot of patience to make these things work. We need a lot of patience in all aspects of life, as, especially as teachers, I think. But a good structure, good communication, answering questions uh, is key. If I'm going to be a bit critical about my workplace, Malmö University, is that the pandemic hit, first week I changed things, or we changed things as teachers, and then we didn't get really very much support to do, to change the way we worked. So the first week the seminars were in Zoom, and I must say Zoom has worked brilliantly from my point of view. Um, the first week was seminars in Zoom, and week 52 was still seminars in Zoom more or less the same way. There was not much time to reflect or think about how to change the way uh, we should teach. Because I think everybody was hoping that we were just going to go back to the way it was before, basically. Again, if you have any questions, just raise your hand. Yes. <laughs> Just uh, a thought on, the, um, on to follow up on, on the change rate after you adopted Zoom. I'm thinking about also the willingness to change from the uh, students' perspective. Uh, to Zoom or from Zoom or? No, to, to evolve within Zoom. Yes. Uh, I think uh, that could be an aspect of it as, mm -hmm. as, a, as, a, as, a, as an educator as well, that maybe you don't want to push so much after a quite a significant uh, change. I don't know what you're thinking. Yeah, it's, I, I, I pushed quite a lot, especially with the cameras. Um, and I've, every seminar, 
for lectures, I didn't actually uh, push that hard because the lecture is still there, they're mainly listening. But for seminars, when you have a discussion, I pushed hard to actually turn on the camera. Because there is, especially, so for me as a teacher, okay, I can talk to, or I can, I can talk and there's a black screen. It's sort of fine. But when another student wants to talk and there's nobody there to talk to except for maybe me, I don't think that's the, so much fun. So I, I pushed quite hard to make them turn on the cameras and not successfully because you can't push, push, push. And the university actually didn't give us any tools to push either because they talked about integrity and uh, respect for privacy, that if you show the background, then it was a breach of that integrity and, and privacy. I don't fully agree, especially since Zoom has this you can, the function that you can put a picture so nobody sees your background. Uh, now, if it's an examination and a seminar, for instance, is usually an examination. You have to be at the seminar to actually uh, be graded on that assignment. So today at seminars, we can say you have to have the camera on. But a year ago, we couldn't. And this is sort of a problem that th this, because it is really, really easy to you don't want to be seen. It's really easy that you think that I'm just listening. It doesn't matter if I have my camera on or off. But the presence is really important, I think. Uh, so I, a certain amount of push, I think, is necessary. And this comes back to patience, that you have to push again and again and again, and probably with the same students, because some students will always have the camera on and some will never have the camera on. Um, but I, I, I think it's important to do it. Okay, just to give you a small background, what I've been teaching or the way I, I have been teaching is that it's the, the, the teacher learning uh, activities I've been doing is mainly theoretical. It's lectures, seminars. I'm not a big fan of lectures. I think they're really good to push out information quickly, but you can't be sure that anybody listens. So it's better mainly to make them read the book instead. Uh, but it works just to remind them of the book, basically. Uh, but seminars I like, because then you can discuss stuff. Uh, and you can uh, make a conversation happen. And I actually think that the fewer you have in the seminar, the better it is. If you have a two-hour seminar with ten people, n there's not enough time, basically, to say stuff. But if you have four people and they have an assignment, they're supposed to do something in the seminar too, then there is suddenly enough time for everybody to speak and actually speak in so much that they start to think before they speak. Is that, um, does it make sense? A lot of people, in my opinion, uh, they speak before they think, but if they have started speaking, then they also start to think and then they speak better. This is my opinion. Uh, <clears throat> discussion groups, seminars and workshops, and then submissions and examinations, feedback and reflection. Examinations was quite interesting because we actually set up, uh, we, we couldn't use the halls anymore. So we had to set up examinations digitally too, um, which meant mostly multiple choice questions. And in, here in, in Sweden, I'd say, but also at Malmö University, we're not really used to multiple choice questions. Uh, the US uses a lot more which is, so they're more used to it. They're more or less better at making interesting um, uh, examinations with multiple choice questions that are, that actually test what it's supposed to test. Whereas we have open-ended questions mostly. I like multiple choice because it's so fast to correct, but it can take a long time to actually construct. And I think that's a more interesting thing to construct things than to correct things, but that's me. Um, so this, so, so you get a picture, y you see, it's not really a lot of practical stuff that I've been teaching. So, but this is where I come from. The digital classroom, what was good about it, and I mean zoom here, uh, is that everybody's equally close. Everybody can hear you equally well. And I, th I don't know how about you, but I, ha I can see the misconception among students that if you sit in the first row, 
you're seen by the teacher and you look at ten, you look like you want to be there and you're interested and a lot of stuff. When I have a lecture, for instance, and I stand up and there's it's a huge hall and 80, 90 students in the hall, I don't even look at the first row. I look somewhere at the f fifth, sixth row. I don't see the students who are on the first row. They can hear a lot better. They can see a lot better who are in the first row. But if you want to hide, the first row is the best place to hide, actually. Um, breakout rooms, I think, was a good thing. A very easy way to put to create small groups and put them in there so they c the students can discuss with each other. And uh, in that case, and then pop in and out if they have any questions. So that was nice. I've had in the physical house breakout rooms, so to speak. Say I've, I've told in seminars that now you're going to create groups and then you're going to sit wherever you want. And if you have any questions, I'll be here, but I also walk around, which meant that I mainly walked around trying to find students because they were everywhere. They, was, they even switched floors sometimes. I couldn't find them. But in breakout rooms, the breakout rooms is there. You can just pop in, see, do you have any questions, then pop out again to the next room or whatever. So that, I think, worked very well. Sharing the screen also, I think, worked very well. It's a... Like here, we have this screen for all of you, but if you, for all on YouTube, for instance, you have a big screen uh, that you can look at and examine easier and actually see everything. So I like this part. And as I said, I like Zoom. I, I think it's Zoom has actually worked brilliantly in this, uh, during this year. There has been a lot of, there has been issues, but mainly it has worked really, really well. So I, Hope they will survive the non-pandemic times, but we'll see. Um, what wasn't so good in the digital classroom, I think this is, and this I think is a very big thing about e-learning, is the socializing part. Because in the classroom, before you get into the classroom, you can talk to your fellow students or you can pop up to the teacher and ask something, something like that. But in Zoom, everybody's in the room. Everything you talk about, everybody hears. So you can't actually ask any private questions. You don't talk to your fellow students in Zoom either because you don't have this transition into the room. Uh, you don't have the transition out of the room. You don't go for coffee together, things like that. So the social aspects of e-learning and digital learning, I think, needs to be worked on. It's, I'm going to talk a bit more about it later. For me, you see, I, this is the first time in almost two years I'm standing up giving a talk. I love it because I've been sitting for a year and a half and the energy sitting down is totally different from standing up for me. Um, so I like this a lot better. We talked about the camera off. This is not really, it's not actually a, a student situation. So these are not students. This is another meeting I was in. So that I took, but and so there's only one camera off. But would that, if this would have been the students, it would have been more or less one camera on instead. For me, chat didn't doesn't work at all. When I'm having a lecture seminar, when I'm talking, f also s having to look at the chat for questions or comments or whatever. Uh, doesn't work. I can't do that because I lose focus and then I uh, stop talking and then I do something else. So that multitasking part is not for me. I don't know if how it is for you guys, girls, um, but yeah, so it is. And then Zoom. There has been a lot of problems with technical, not technical issues, but uh, use, user experience issues with Zoom. People haven't haven't had had uh, haven't updated their Zoom, so they couldn't go into breakout rooms themselves, um, things like that. So there has been technical issues with Zoom, and also, yeah, I'll get to one more thing about Zoom in a second. Um, and waiting rooms, I think it's it has some merits when you have a lot of students coming into a Zoom meeting. But it, my colleagues turn them on too when we have me staff meetings, which again takes away the socializing part because instead of actually talking to the people who showed up a bit early, 
you sit there watching a screen of Zoom saying that the meeting will open when the attendant comes. And for some reason, the person calling the meeting is always the last one coming to the meeting. I have no idea why. But Zoom meetings is, as I said, the camera, or the, the, the camera on or camera off, worked so-so. I've seen students sitting smoking, uh, and it's fine. They're at home. They can do whatever they want. Uh, but it's still, it's the, the, the presence. Uh, being there is not as um, forceful as in the classroom. I've seen students suddenly pop up by a pool in Spain. Also, it's like the week before, that student was in at home, and then they are in Spain, which is also fine, as long as they do what they want, they're, they're supposed to do. So it's, it's either a good or a bad thing, but depending on the... But the presence is... could lack. Students with in bed, lots of students in bed. And that could also be fine if they had a lamp so you could actually see them because there has been a, a lot of students in bed in dark rooms. And they will, they have probably fallen asleep. And dogs, of course, dogs, 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 and cats, and lots, lots of cats and dogs. Um, and the final thing that I think about presence and focus is multitasking. In some way, a lot of the students show up with... Uh, on their phone, their smartphone. I tend to like that, but they also move around. So you get this background moving around all the time, and that is distracting when you're sitting there watching, even if it's a, just a small small uh, picture. You, you see them walking around. Uh, and on the other hand, if you're, you can't multitask on, on a device like this, you n you're only in the Zoom meeting. You can't take notes at the same time, in my view. Okay, some good and bad practices, I think. <coughs> uh, question and answers. Uh, for all courses, for anything that you should teach, have somewhere to where the, the students can actually come in and ask questions and do it all the time. Another th good thing about e-learning is that it's asyn asynchronous that we don't actually care about office hours and stuff. As long as everybody accepts that if you, if you put, a, put out a question there, you don't get an immediate answer. It could take 24 hours or even 48 hours. It's fine. But have a question and an answer, um, uh, a place to ask questions uh, and to get answers. The good thing with having and not emailing all the time to a specific teacher is also that everybody can see each other's questions and answers. Structure is very, very important, I believe. I was at this digital marketing course I was talking about when they did the video together. That was more or less on the verge of collapsing uh, because the teacher had it, he was extremely overworked. So he was like, he was saying, we will, you will get that information later. Um, so I come, came in and what I basically did, I, I put in structure in our learning management system. We use Canvas at Malmö University. Uh, just saying on that date, this should happen, and on that date, and this, and this, and this. And then the student got, I, I wouldn't say happy, but they got less unhappy at least. Um, another thing I'm thinking about is assignment before admission. For seminars, for instance, that we need, if the student is supposed to be there, and we are supposed to have a discussion, maybe they should have done what they're supposed to do before they actually get into the seminar. Okay. Peter Lundqvist asked, uh, work with the side moderator taking in questions from the chat and posing them to the lecture when appropriate, like this. Uh, yeah, that's a good thing. Uh, I, 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 I'm all for it. If you have an, uh, an assistant when you are actually holding the, uh, the whatever you are, seminar or whatever. Because keeping track of two things at once, for me, it doesn't work. I think it's really, it's a good idea, but you need to be able to... Who should I talk to now? You or the camera? Anyway, um, it, I think it's, it's, it's hard if you don't have anybody who can help you with the chat 
and usually as I think at least teachers at university level we don't have it much in the way of assistance we're qu quite alone in seminars and, and stuff okay I need to speak speed up a bit so we can have a discussion it wasn't supposed to be this close okay camera on microphone off is very good update the software we talked about this this one pedagogy first I think is really really important Everything we do should come with pedagogy first. And I think it's kind of easy to say when it's e-learning, it's the technology first. It's understanding the technology and, and getting, in, getting that part in. I also believe that pedagogy is different in e-learning settings than it is in a physical setting. Slightly, not all of it very different, but some things are different. Um, bad practices. I'm going to go to Sir Frederick, uh, Yes. He has a follow-up question. Yes, I believe he has. I'm not at all uh, yeah. Use surprised. Use a student, damn it. What? what? Use a student, damn it. Oh, yeah, that might be good when you work in the private sector actually in the <laughs> in those organizations that you can use students in that way. Yes. But we still have to pay the students, so uh, it doesn't always work. Um, okay, this, I, I, I wanted to put some, some sort of theory, not me, just me speaking today. There is a very good book called E-Moderating, I think it's a very good book, talking about how to set up uh, e-learning uh, and what to think about when constructing a, a course in e-learning. And basically, the first three stages in any course is to make sure they can actually use all the tools they're supposed to do, use, and then make them talk a bit about themselves within this course on the learning management system, for instance. So everybody presents themselves, so everybody actually is a person and not just some sort of name somewhere. And then you start to show them how to find information and where which information is interesting. Is it a book or is it on the net or wherever it is? After that, you actually start with the knowledge that they're supposed to learn according to this book, and I think it's right. Because you need these steps to make sure that everybody is online, online, if you see what I mean. Um, and then in the last pla place, you have development. And we could talk about other things like constructive alignment, which is what we use uh, in Imam University, that we say what they're supposed to learn, and then we map examinations and everything to, to what they have learned, or it's what we said they're supposed to learn. You all probably recognize this. Um, andragogy is pedagogy for adults. I'm very much into that because I don't teach, never I have never taught children. And I think is there are certain differences that are important to talk about. I think the, one of the biggest uh, um, differences is that we have to motivate an adult to learn something. You can't just tell them to be there at, one, at some point. Uh, and this motivation needs to be stronger, basically. I believe feedback on every assignment, or whatever it is, is really, really important. Uh, because that's a very, very big part of learning. And I think we actually have too little time to give feedback as teachers. Because yeah, the, the other week I was examining 80 assignments. Each was about 10 pages long. And, it's like there is, and they were all about the same thing too. So there isn't really much time and my motivation to actually go through each in detail lessons, basically. But I think feedback is really, really important. So it should be given time and, we, and uh, as a teacher, you should have that time. Um, a reflection, I also think, and this is the student reflecting on their own learning, is also very important, I believe. Can help a lot, and I actually have an idea how to do that. We usually, at Malmö University, at the end of a course, they are supposed to reflect on what they have done. I think it would be a lot better if they did it during the course, and I think you can use Twitter to do that. But anyway, but you can't use Twitter because of GDPR. Uh, now I have four slides, so now I don't want any questions for these four slides because I'm just going to say some, some stuff, and then we can have a discussion about it. Uh, 
so what e-learning is and what it should be. And as you see, it's going to be four slides, so we'll start with the first one. The first thing I'm going to say is that we learn all the time. We can't help it. It doesn't matter what we do. Right now, I'm standing here uh, giving a talk in this setting. I have learned a lot about how to give the next talk, for instance. Or a PIN code for a, uh, a card, a bank card, is, a new, is something that we need to learn. Or astronomy. Or how the washing machine works. Or how to sing in a choir or how to be a nurse, or how to just socialize. We learn all the time. And what I think we need to do is to channel this learning in a way so that A, that we learn what we want to learn, and B, in a way that so that we actually can learn it. Um, today, I'd say that these are the main places for e-learning that you can be at. It's like YouTube is very big on learning. Uh, Google Scholar, if you read a lot of papers, books, uh, lynda.com is now uh, LinkedIn Learning, um, and so on. This one is quite interesting, Hippocampus. It's uh, from Karolinski Institute, a group of students who built some sort of AI learning system to uh, teach med medicine. The second thing I, I want to say is that learning is better if guided and curated. This is the problem I have with YouTube. There's a lot of things you can learn on YouTube, and a lot of those things are wrong, or it takes a really, really long time to find the good stuff. And I play backgammon a lot on my iPhone. I probably play backgammon against a real live person about five times in my life or something. Uh, and it has an AI that is a lot better than me. And I still haven't figured out the strategy for playing backgammon, because just by playing backgammon, I can't just get better at playing backgammon. I need somebody to t tell me, you did that wrong there. You should do that in this situation, stuff like that. So me sitting alone with my AI doesn't really help me get a better, become a better backgammon player. The other thing is you can, by your own, build a bridge, something like this. But you need guidance to build a bridge like that. You need a lot of knowledge, a lot of information to be able to construct that bridge. So I think these are not actually brains, I think they are walnuts. But I think a lot of, wal a lot of walnuts are better than one walnut. Uh, that if we use, can use brains together, we can enhance the learning of each, and single, each single brain. I also think that e-learning should be mobile. Because this is what the majority, about 90% of every not every person, but the, uh, everybody has a smartphone. And when I say everybody, I don't mean everybody, but almost everybody. But not everybody has a computer. So this is the way to actually access the digital world for huge uh, amounts of, of the population in, in the world. So we should design e-learning to work here, not there, I think. Because the that also gives us a location. Uh, we don't need to be in a certain location to do e-learning, if it's on the smartphone. We can be wh wherever we want, whenever we want, in an easier way than with the computer. And we don't need all these houses anymore. I don't understand why the universities still have, have all these houses. I totally understand why they have them, but they shouldn't have them. Location, agnostic, you can sit by a lake or on the bus, and this is also micro-learning. I think micro-learning is really interesting. If you have four minutes on the bus, how can we challenge, how can we uh, make that into a learning situation? And I think e-learning could help there. So, and e-learning, lifelong learning, I think this is really, really important. We need to talk about better, more about this. Uh, and I think that the people who are talking about it right now hasn't really gotten it, basically. Because we're talking about everybody learning all the time, all through life, in a structured way. Other things I think is in the future is augmented reality and mixed reality and virtual reality, AI, mobility, simulations, gamification, micro-learning, and 
also flip the classroom is a good thing. Flip the classroom is, I think it's kind of hard because it takes so much time, but I think it's important. Challenges, how may we enhance the social aspects? I think this is a big one because we are not made to sit alone in our rooms and learn by ourselves. So we need to get that into e-learning, better at least. Uh, we have a lot of tools right now. I was saying before that I thought reflections that you use in the course could be, for instance, via Twitter, that you ask the students to tweet on their learning every week, twice, twice every week, in a Twitter format. What, what is that, 240 characters or something? Excellent, because then they have to be brief. And they're, as my students are media technology students, they need to learn Twitter too. But GDPR stopped that. Couldn't use Twitter because I couldn't ask the students to sign up for Twitter to do this. Uh, practical learning, I should have said biggie here too. I've been talking a lot about my experiences as a theoretical teacher. How do we get a nurse or a medical doctor that actually needs patients and prod the patients and talk to the patient? How do we, how do, we do that? Time zones and LMSs and GDPR. Time zones is obvious, I think. How do you have a seminar when everybody's in on different parts of the world? But LMSs and GDPR, I've looked at it quite a lot and used quite a lot of LMSs. I still haven't found one that's actually, its foundation is in pedagogy rather than structure and administration. Okay, pedagogy is everything, I think. And this is supposed to be that two poodles discussing. This is two poodles discussing, so maybe we could discuss a bit now. What do you say? Any thoughts? Any comments or questions? Or pizzas? Just uh, I have a question about Friedrich. What yes. Thank you. What is the flip classroom? Okay, uh, the flip classroom is that instead of teaching the stuff that you want to teach, when they come into the classroom, you give them the material before, like a video or something, and then you discuss this uh, uh, material in the classroom. So you basically, instead of doing the homework, that you, you teach it in the classroom, you, and you give homework, you actually do the homework in the classroom with the teacher present so that you can ask questions and stuff. That's w one way to, to uh, explain it, but it's, that's one, that's, yeah. Okay. Yes. Yes, of course. I can't help but see a big contradiction or, a, 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 yeah, a contradiction uh, in the trend of uh, this being the way to go. Well, at the same time, as you said somewhere there in the, in the beginning, you need to build a relationship with the student so that you can get the student to, to believe you, to trust you, mm. and so on. And I think uh, I'm myself a high, I'm a high school uh, teacher, mm. and I think that's key. It's yeah. like you, you don't get anything without it. Yes. And I don't know how you can do it uh, that way uh, through 100% e-learning or remote learning. Um, yeah, so I don't, I don't see no, that uh, yeah. hang, how, how, how that go. Uh, my, my, my take on it is that um, it is harder, but we have the structures to help. So it's like me being at a university and the student is at a university, they sort of assume that I know what I'm talking about. So they assume that I should be trusted. They assume that I'm a teacher that actually will, can, and should examine them. Uh, and that helps. So in a way, that structure, and it's also high school. You have the house, and you have the principal, and you have all the other teachers and all the other students. Uh, but I agree with you. It, I think it's a challenge. I think it's one of the bigger challenges to actually, how do you, how do you get the trust? How do you get this structure? How do you get the, the students to to do what they want, you, what you want them to do. There's a question above you, or a comment. Um, I also have a question. I mean, 
the way you present it here, it almost seems like you want e-learning to replace physical learning. Yeah, right? that could. Yeah. And mm -hmm. what is the uh, so my question is, what is the aim of this? Is it to replace it because, or is it to augment it and enhance it mm -hmm. and use e-learning strategically where? Um, it actually is a big benefit to mm. use e-learning mm. and not maybe in some of the other issues with relationship, uh, li like building yeah. relationships and uh, practical skill learning and uh, like there are aspects that the physical, you know, that yeah. the physical space has yes. a lot of. Yeah. It, uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm going to be mean. I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to give you my take on it. Yeah. <coughs> and, and this is, for theoretical subjects, I think e-learning actually works to actually take away the classroom. The physical classroom where, where this, the students sit or the, the pupils sit at their desks. Uh, that, is, that is one place where e-learning actually really works today. But if we talk about, and I think I would actually say that maybe 60% or 70% of medical training is that. But then you have the 30% or 40% that is something else. So I'm going to be mean and say, what do you think? How should we solve this? I have an opinion about everything. Excellent. <laughs> no, I mean, I think it is a cumbersome task to think that we should uh, replace all learn, like all learning spaces or, or place them all in the digital sphere. I think, I mean, also because I do believe that going to university and as you say, like meeting other students and seeing yourself in a different place they haven't been before. Um, and like is ha is a transformational experience as well, and I think that there is something being lost if we take away all the university buildings and we do it all on our phone. Um, so I do think, but but at the but the but then I do th as well that there's a lot to be gained uh, specifically through having some things happen in the digital sphere. Yeah. And I think, but I think coming back to the like core questions of pedagogy and why we teach can help us, to guide us, when is it that we want the physical space and when do we want it? Yeah, uh, and, and, and I agree with you. I, I totally agree that e-learning is not for everything, but I think it could be for more than what we have it right now. There was a question over there. Yes, um, maybe also touching a little bit on that. Um, I was also curious, like, what other tools have you tried or were you experimenting with? Because you mentioned Zoom a lot or Canva, but there's so much more also, like, looking into the social aspect because, I mean, just having a lecture on Zoom is not really e-learning. But what else have you experienced in that time? Yeah, but uh, for, for instance, Mentimeter right now, th that creates a, s a certain amount of... of uh, interactivity with the students. You can actually post questions and then they can answer uh, in a way that is not, that everybody, a lot more students answer. Because if you are in the, in the classroom or, or in a lecture hall and you ask a question, maybe one student, if you're really, really lucky, two students start arguing. That is always fun. Uh, and then and, and argue with you. That's also always fun. But in the Mentimeter, uh, Mentimeter for instance, you can, do, you can get information uh, from all, from a lot more students, uh, and then you can bring that into the lecture, and then you can discuss what the answer were, and and then people actually wrote something. They can say, "Yeah, uh, I wrote that," and then you ask, "Okay, what did you mean?" Did you also use Mentimeter or something in the? Yes, class? yeah, I have. Yeah. Uh, but but this is also goes back to this, like uh, having the time to actually develop, and I think this this w w us sitting here is also me learning how can it be better. Uh, because I, d during my, my time at Malmö University, there wasn't actually time. There was just pandemic and then students, 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 and then there was some vacation and then more students, students, students. So uh, there was too little time to, to, to develop what, what has been, what could be good. Yes. Uh, I mean, e-learning was, e -learning wasn't invented during the pandemic. It's I agree. It's been a thing for some time. I agree. Um, have you had a chance to talk to others who have done this longer? And uh, yeah, uh, yes, uh, yeah, but that was the answer to the question. What was, um, I, yeah, I, I talked to others and uh, they have uh, more or less, uh, also practical people, as uh, so people who, who teach practically, uh, and they have uh, uh, very different opinions from me. 
how to do stuff. Um, I didn't incorporate this today because I, I didn't want to get too technical or theoretical. Uh, so I was trying to jumpstart a conversation. That's, that was my aim today. Yeah, so I'm not a teacher, but uh, following the media and so forth, so I have got the big picture that the more we have technology and the better technology we have, the less teachers have time for their students and the more busy the, t the teachers are. So how do you see that? Have you seen increased workload here or is it decreasing workload for the teachers? Yeah, but I, I have seen increased workload, absolutely. Uh, but I think this, this goes way longer, it's like with the learning management systems that we're using, uh, that has more or less put a, lot, a higher burden on the teacher to do administrative stuff that they didn't do before. Before they just took the exams and handed over to somebody who sorted them and, and gave the, uh, everything to do, or the grades to the students. Uh, so it has been going on for a long time. And, I d and the administrative or the, the workload has, ri has risen because we as teachers have had to find what works in our setting ourselves. It's like we've talked to each other and we can find different tools that we can use. But um, it has mainly been on us to, to solve this. I just would like to add to that. I think also that we're all competing for attention. And uh, as an educator as well, once you put a device, w once the device is sort of the channel, then you you can you're even more competing with the student to to not let the student go away. And and I think as an educator, then you have to think even more on how you can keep uh, the student there. Yeah. Um, so that's also another challenge. There's an enormous potential, but also the challenge. Yeah, but I, I also think that there has to be a reason for us to exist so and not only YouTube. Because in a way you can be a, become anything on YouTube or become and become, but you can learn almost anything on YouTube. So why teachers in this case? We're not even going to talk about AI at the moment. We're just talking about YouTube. So I, I think we need to keep their attention. We need to say that we have something that we can uh, give them that they can't get anywhere else. And I think curation is one of the things. Like th this, this is the knowledge you need for this, to become this or for this particular course or whatever. I've, I've, I've looked all, on all the information and I say, this is the information you need. Or you can go on YouTube and find all the information yourself. It's there, go. But it's gonna take you two years instead of five weeks. That's one reason, I think. Yes. Yeah. Uh just curious, has the thought of the marriage of the two been considered, like physical and e-learning, and maybe recheck of the policy so that both parties are not like lost in the process? Being like a student, also the fact of physically going there kind of motivates someone to actually attend the yeah. session so I can see yeah. other stuff. Yeah. At the same time, uh, maybe going there every day is not actually practical or working. Mm. Holding other factors constant, don't even mention about pandemic and stuff, because hopefully this will not go forever. But the marriage of the two and the rechange of the policy, mm. where that not Monday, Friday, I'm there, but maybe we come to school physically when there are those, maybe it's fun in groups and the other sessions, because we're learning like we have talked, it's not something which started now. It's been there, but maybe the combination of the two. Any thought of that? No, I, I think it's, a, for me, I think it's a good idea to separate that some things you actually do in the houses if, if we have to keep them, uh, but some things you can actually do on your own outside somewhere else. Uh, what I don't really believe in is hybrid learning where you have like some people on a screen and some people in the classroom. In my experience, the few times I've done it, it hasn't worked. The people on the screen, they're not even there. You don't see them. They don't participate. Nothing happens. So I'd, either everybody's on the screen or everybody's in the classroom. Can you wrap it up? Yes, I'm going to wrap it up. I have one question to you. Is this a good list of what this group should be about? Or do you want to add something or just, no, not that one.
Sure. Yes, Mika. Um, uh, I would like to add, like, the purpose, you know, returning to the purpose of, uh, of why we do it, like, of using e-learning. I think it's really interesting because I think it has a lot of purposes that need to be... Uh, okay, excellent. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Mikke. Uh, pizza is, uh, has arrived. It's cold. Oh. Uh,